Well, praise the Lord. I just want to read out a letter that I'm going to send, uh, you know, to our friends and missionaries throughout the world to explain uh, Friday night's uh, prayer meeting. And uh, it will be a kind of a skelet because we might add to it. But uh, I want to be very careful, uh, you know, if you do any writing or to anybody that you're very careful what you say, what has happened and still has to happen. And so this is what I'm going to say. It is with heartfelt appreciation that I wish to thank all of you who prayed Friday on February the 18th and at other times for my healing. The following morning, as I rose from my bed, I felt a new strength. I could walk without the aid of my walking stick. I felt invigorated. I also feel that the Lord is preparing my heart for a transplant from my old heart that is worn out to one from heaven above. And uh, I, I see something in my heart as though it's being opened up and I cannot explain it. You can't see anything physically but in the spirit. And, uh, and certainly the Lord is indicating through several prayer meetings that he's only begun a work in me. But the culmination will come shortly when he brings together many things uh, this was brought out here in uh, the prayer meeting Thursday in prophecy and uh, also Kitchener and I think one or two other places the sense was God was working in many places and that uh, this healing is predicated on God doing certain things in certain places. And uh, we are not sure uh, what he means by many things, but we must just trust him. And if we do so, then eventually all things will be made clear again to us. And again, it is with deep gratitude that I Thank you for your prayers and you've helped me through one of the most difficult periods and painful periods of my life. And I haven't really shared some of the uh, agonies I've been through, but I could not have got through them without... um, your prayers because it's been a long period of time several years and uh, it is with gratitude that I'm seeing a kind of preamble of what God is going to do and restore but um, I am not sure quite what he has done in me at the moment I certainly can walk without the walking stick for which I'm very grateful and uh, I went out yesterday for the first time for about three hours in a car and uh, I managed that very well which I wouldn't have been able to do a day or two before and so God has done something in me but uh, there are limitations I can feel I cannot do certain things and certainly he has not touched my eyes or my ears yet and uh, I, I'm not quite sure how much I can do and how much I cannot do and uh, I don't want to be foolish and um, over to what he has done in my spirit I feel I could do anything 
but my body does not respond. So uh, be very careful what you write to people. Uh, you can just say that I was touched of the Lord, I'm stronger, I'm invigorated, but I still have many limitations. I have to, I realize I cannot do certain things. And I think God is doing that uh, because um, there's something greater than he's working out, and we don't know what it is. But uh, it's obviously in various places. So, um, you know, don't uh, guess at what God's going to do, you know, but uh, we do know that when he does eventually come on the scene, it will be glorious for everyone. And uh, then during this time, you know, that I've been so incapacitated, God has been blessing the fellowship and I, I'll just read the latest uh, email we have from Carlos Rivas and uh, he says that God has made it possible for us to launch the Bible Institute online and uh, We will have to look uh, with our high-tech people exactly how we work this out. But he said, we can count 30 people in Ecuador, about 2025 in Canada, and we will have students in Colombia and people studying in the USA and Central America and Germany. I presume this is in Spanish. Yes. So it must be Spanish people in those countries. And then he goes on to say, uh, he's going back to Quito, Ecuador. And uh, he's been asked to teach a seminar again there in February. And... Uh, also, then afterwards, he will be uh, preaching in Timbez, Peru. So we thank God. You know, I asked him to touch these countries, and he succeeded, and uh, he has this multimedia venture. And so Zion is spreading everywhere, and we've got this wonderful hub. In Melbourne, with Lawton Ho, who is working on it there. And that seems to be going everywhere too. So God is really blessing Zion. And uh, also, uh, I'm being told by various people that they feel God is going to make Zion available in every country so it's very humbling but we have to go through this period of trial to bring to birth what God eventually has in mind for us everywhere now the last two Sundays I've been talking about the fact that God has been leading me to Zephaniah chapter 2. <laughs> that he's been leading me to Zephaniah chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3, uh, where he gives the admonition to seek meekness, seek righteousness. It may be that we shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And it's clear that uh, we're seeing amongst the nations now upheaval after upheaval and I'm sure it will come to the United States and uh, my concern and my burden is that you be protected during this time well that is predicated on us doing these two things 
seeking meekness, seeking righteousness, it may be that you will be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And so I think it's my responsibility to guide the ship of Zion into the waters of meekness and righteousness. And we've talked about meekness the last two Sundays. And I want to talk about righteousness, righteousness, because uh, it is troubling me, you know, that we are seeking God and uh, things are surfacing in the fellowship where people have in fact been living double lives and uh, it's very grieving to pass Wallace myself to 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 see this but it's better that you know if you're not living the life please come to Pastor Wallace and and he'll pray for you and put things right I'm not in the position I can pray for people at the moment but uh, I am very saddened and grieved by some of the revelations that we're getting and uh, you know it all depends on your roots you know where are your roots you know what is that which you desire in life and I want you to think on that what is my goal what is my desire and uh I hope it is that you will say, well, my desire is to be holy. My desire is to be righteous. Well, my desire is to be meek. You see, those roots will hold you. And uh, yet I'm facing situations where people externally seem to be blessed, but internally there is rottenness and I I just plead with you that if that is the case put it right now the one thing that you will not be able to do is to hide it from the Lord well so I want to speak a little bit about righteousness it's the other main virtue along with meekness that um one has to have to qualify to be hidden and you know in 1st John chapter 3 and verse 7 you know the apostle says little children let no man deceive you let no man deceive you and many are deceived in this area of righteousness and uh, the point that I want to bring out here is this that uh, Satan is the arch deceiver and whilst uh, there are umpteen warnings concerning the second coming you know be careful you're not deceived yet he works in this area of deception in the realm of righteousness and the scribes and Pharisees were completely deceived and they felt that because they came from Abraham's bosom shall I say that Abraham they would be all right and they were completely deceived And that's why John the Baptist had to say this. He said, think not because you come from Abraham that you'll be all right. And uh, it's not in scripture, but it is in uh, the writings of the Jews that uh, this is what they taught, actually what they taught, some of the teachers taught. 
they said if there was a, an Israelite so very wicked that it was certain he was going to hell he would be all right because there would be Father Abraham at the mouth of hell ready to catch him and put him back into heaven. I mean, things like that. They were absolutely deceived. But in the church, people are deceived. You know, I've talked to leaders who... Um, have fallen into sin and covered their sin and I said well why 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 and they would come back with this statement well we thought we were special and God would understand that uh, we were doing his work and that our little dalliances, our little streaks of wickedness, he would overlook. But he doesn't. And uh, with God, there's no respect of persons. And many people, I mean, uh, I remember... We were traveling in the southern states, my wife and myself. And I had a, a vision of a, a woman, but I, I didn't really see her face. But it seemed to me that we were going to meet this woman. Or women, I wasn't sure. Well, we went to a church that we had not been to before. And uh, I was amazed. First of all, there was a woman preacher. And this is what she did. She held out her hand like this. She said, if you accuse somebody else, there's three fingers pointing back at yourself. And the pastor was going, amen, 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 you know. In other words, don't criticize somebody for their lifestyle well that's so very wrong well then when the service finished uh, we uh, were sitting in the uh, pews and we turned and there was a lady behind us there was two women you see and uh, this lady said oh I love this church she said, I was with the Assemblies of God, I was with so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. But she said, this church is so different. It doesn't matter how you live. They accept you. Well, completely deceived. And I don't want that in Zion. I mean, the fact that somebody is a member of a Zion church does not give them the latitude to have a double life. God will root it out. Well, I just want to comment a bit about righteousness. He says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. All right, so what is righteousness doing those things that are righteous and what does God determine that uh, there are righteous acts and wicked acts well in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 5 we have about 17 statements on righteousness First of all, that a man be just and do which is lawful and right. Well, first of all, that a man be just and do that which is lawful and right. And so those are our actions. And then it goes on uh, to various things, has not oppressed anybody uh, 
was not stolen and so forth but have walked in my statues Ezekiel 18 verse 9 kept my judgments to deal truly he is just he shall surely live says the Lord God in other words you can meditate upon the, that passage and check off the points and saying am I fulfilling this and then uh, the Lord when he taught on the Sermon on the Mount says that uh, except our righteousness exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees will in no wise enter the kingdom of God and theirs was an outward righteousness and so the apostle Paul you know said that he was blameless concerning the law but all those things were nothing and uh, he spoke on the righteousness of God being imputed to us and as we believe that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead for our sins then we are counted righteous we are counted righteous we are counted righteous but then there are degrees of righteousness degrees of righteousness first of all there's imputed acts of righteousness and then secondly there are the acts of righteousness and uh, I'd like to refer to Matthew you know chapter 3 whereby the Lord speaking to John the Baptist concerning water baptism says it is necessary that we fulfill all righteousness so righteousness also includes fulfilling the ordinances of God so that when we submit to water baptism we are fulfilling an act of righteousness and uh, then uh, we have that thought that in Hebrews 11 those heroes of the faith as we call them were told to do certain things and uh, when they did those things you know it was accounted righteous to them to them and uh, when God tells us to do something you know we must do it because it is an expression of righteousness so I, I commend that to you you know he said water baptism he said it it's necessary that we fulfill all righteousness so that means that everything that God has ordained in our lives when we do it is counted to us for righteousness because in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 you know, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And so when God speaks to us to do something by faith, we do it. It's counted unto us for righteousness. And then 
there's another step up, if I could say that, in Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Yet the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So therefore, there is a walking in the faith of Christ. A walking in the faith of Christ. And uh, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, Paul swings to the negative and he says, what is not of faith is sin. So that our lives must walk in faith. So that the things we do, we are doing by the faith of the Son of God. And obviously he will not give faith to the things he has not ordained for us to do. So, there we have the thought, you know, of living, as it were, by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And as we are obedient then the righteousness of God is counted to us. And then there's another step in righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, it says this, He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. So we want to be filled with the righteousness of God, and we must hunger and thirst for that. And then at the end of our days, the Apostle Paul speaks of the fact that a crown of righteousness is awaiting him because he's done those things that God has ordained for his life. And now there is the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness. And the fruit of righteousness is peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, Isaiah speaks of the fact that, you know, if you've been righteous, you know, your peace would have been like the sand on the seashore. In other words, an abundance. Righteousness and peace go together. And one of the fruits of righteousness is peace. And also the Lord has taught me this. Uh, When I have a choice to make and I make the right choice, then I'm going to enjoy the fruit of that choice. The fruit of that choice. And there's always fruit to everything we do. You know, sometimes people who have done wrong and they confess it and are purified from it. Yet, they're going to suffer the consequences of their actions, the consequences of their actions. And, uh, you know, most of you are very young here. And I would tell you from my experience as one who is old that you listen to your leaders for they have experience. And I know of people who have been warned and warned and warned and will not listen, well, they suffer the consequences of their disobedience. And I tell you this, 
The way of the backslider is hard. So, listen to what we say. We do know what we are talking about. We have had the advantage of seeing people's lives, especially mine, because I've outlived many people. And I've seen them start, and I've seen them finish. And I want to tell you this. If your life has been marred by disobedience and it has not been put right at the end of the life your life there's great sadness I had recently somebody come to me and say well I had the opportunity but I blew it I want to suffer the consequences well actually I was able because of my position to say well we're going to give you another chance and uh, I'm hoping that they will take it but I've seen people have other chances and still blow it so I've walked with many people and I've seen them fall to the right and to the left because they have failed on this area of righteousness. They have done things that are not right and not put those things right and I see them at the end of the life, some of them as are, are as old as I am. And, uh, oh, how sad I am for them, how I grieve for them. You see, well, I want the end of your life to be triumphant. And uh, I'm trusting that God will make mine triumphant too. I feel good, but uh, I have my limitations. I have to be very careful. But anyway, there we are. Now, something else about righteousness. Righteousness leads to holiness. You must not make a mistake in thinking that righteousness is holiness. And we have a classic example in the life of Lot. Lot, Peter tells us, was a righteous man. He was vexed with the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah. But you see, he was not holy. And what is the difference between a righteous man and a holy man? Well, essentially, a righteous man loves righteousness and does that which is right, as Lot was doing. But a holy man, the root of holiness is different. It is separation. And Lot could not separate himself from Sodom and Gomorrah. And therefore he lost all. Righteousness should lead to holiness. Whereby you've lived by the grace of God on a pathway where you have been obedient to God. But you must go on from righteousness. There's a little scripture in uh, Revelation 22 and verse 11. Uh, listen to Suzette as she reads this out, please. 
Can you read it out so I can hear? He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You see, that verse makes a distinction between righteousness and holiness. Well, God is righteous, but he's also holy. And uh, we're having some problems in this realm of holiness. It is a separation. You know, and we go back to Psalm 1, verse 1. Would you read that, please, dear? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorn. Yes. Whom you walk with is going to determine the end of your life. And of course, it's very important in this area of marriage. You know, I can think of time after time in my own life. God said, if you marry that girl, you'll be limited. You'll be limited. You won't go on to what I have for you. And she was a very nice girl, very godly, but she had her limitations, which would have limited me. And uh, I went from country to country and Europe. They said, well, why don't you marry that girl, you see? But God has spoken to me. And then along comes somebody from America and God had given her a prophecy and said, you will marry a man of like vision as yourself. And that's what you want. And I was a man of like vision. I didn't have a say in the matter. Were all, you know, snapped up like that. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. My wife told me, she said, God told me I'm going to marry you. I said, oh, God has withheld that secret from me. But anyway, the point is, it's very important, very important whom you marry. But not only whom you marry, but um, whom you walk with. Because you can even be married to the right person. But at work or wherever you go, if you walk with people who are not godly, that can influence you and take you out of the way. So this thing of holiness, you see, Lot was a righteous man but lost everything. Why? He put his tents pointing to Sodom. There was his heart. He wanted the rich, fertile ground of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what they say, what are your roots, you see? Well, his roots were prosperity. See, he, he wanted the blessings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the result was he lost everything. He lost everything. Now, unfortunately, a very dear friend of mine who has blessed me over the years, he was not right in the realm of money and so forth. And the result is he's dying a pauper, both spiritually and financially see I want something better for you 
I want you to arrive in heaven's gates triumphantly. As the bugles blow and announce your coming. That's true. They do that for the, you know, those who've excelled. Well, please think on these things. And uh, then, if the time comes, or when the time comes, that you are responsible for other people. Remember what King David said in, I think it's uh, Second Samuel 23, and verse 2 or 3, He that ruleth over men. That's chapter 23, verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Yes. And... Uh, that is one of the things that uh, Job did. It said that, uh, Job said, you know, if any of my servants have um, a problem, he said, I listen to them. See, and look, this is something that perhaps I can share with you. You know, people are very important. You must not run over people. It doesn't matter how insignificant they appear. You must care for people. And you must always do that which is right in the sight of God to one another. And uh, I've been under people who have not been upright and I've suffered because of it. I've been very deceitful and so forth. But we want to be like Job. You know, that if anybody had a cause... Anybody had a, a need, a complaint, didn't matter how insignificant they were. Even perhaps the maids who were doing this or that, he listened to them. And you must listen to the needs of people and care for people. And whether or not you have a project, that project must take second place to the needs of people. You must care for people. The project will pass away, the person will not. And so, you know, if you're in a position that uh, you are over other people you must look after them and see their needs and uh, care for them the project is number two the person is number one doesn't matter who they are and so that's what King David had to learn you know, he that ruleth over men must be just. He must be just. He must be just. And you must hear a person out, and uh, you must rule justly. If they're right, they're right. If they're wrong, they're wrong. But you must hear in the world. Well... Those are a few thoughts on righteousness. May God grant that each one of us will seek meekness, will seek righteousness. It may be that we should be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. But uh, I'm coming back to this as I close. What 
are your roots? What are your roots? What are your roots? Are your roots, you know, pleasure? Yeah, I don't know, this is flashing back in my mind and I've never recorded it before, but I was at, um, oh, I don't know what you call it, uh, convention, we'll say, convention of young people in England. And, uh, you know, virtually everybody was unmarried. And there was a certain girl there Now, this is a time when England was on rationing and things were hard to get. And people were, uh, were asked, well, what do you want, what do you want, and so forth. This girl said, I want silk stockings. You know, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, that was her goal. Well... She ended up by dying at a young age with cancer. Her goal were clothes and so forth. You see, be careful what your goal is. Be careful what your goal is. Be careful what your goal is. You know, someone uh, woke up to find that they were married, you see. They woke up to find that their husband had died that night, and they didn't know it. And uh, this wife prayed, you see, for her dead husband. We know God we were... And... uh, The Lord impressed upon her. He will never go further. So I'm taking him. Well, we don't want that said of us, do we? We will not go further. But God will lengthen our lives so that we have the opportunity of going further. Well, those are my few comments.